D'Angelo Ross. Yeah. What's good, baby? Man, I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here? Mm-hmm. Formerly known as uh, D Ross. They, st- they still call you D Ross? Yeah, D Ross. They still call you. When did that start? That's, that's from when I was little. I think that's just, just D'Angelo and then the Ross. It's just something people do. It was like your little nickname yeah. and it just kind of stuck. People still call you that now, though, right? D Ross, D Lo, D. <laughs> My old, old name was Snoop ICD. Snoop ICD? Mm-hmm. Did Snoop give you that? Yeah. He gave you that? Mm-hmm. Are you still, you still got uh, close ties with him? Yeah, my okay. uncle still coaches with him. Oh, he does? Yeah. He does. They don't coach. They have this uh, special, this like, it's for um, special kids playing football, flag football. So they do that now instead of doing the whole season with the. The whole season? Yeah. So it's a little more personalized? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, Snoop is always active in the community. I really respect him for that. And I remember when we were at a, when I was playing JUCO at Mount Sac, he bought us like a whole new set of brown, brand new that. jerseys yeah, for that. that. We got to meet him, and I was like super hyped to see him. Yeah. You you know what GGN is? News? He has that little. Yeah, when he's like, yeah, it's like, I know what you're talking. About. Like the background yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of it's more like of a comedy style podcast yeah. like this, but like he has like act like actors and. Yeah, rappers and whatever yeah i told him i was like bro i watch ggn all the time yeah he's like aha nephew that's cool <laughs> i think shoot i think he's doing a an event today with with ross the third really yeah Wait, what kind of event just a camp just the, a little camp some kids. or no no a celebrity basketball game celebrity basketball yeah, game. yeah he's doing that today that's what's up yeah man we got a lot to talk about though it's been a minute since i saw you but you've been through a lot in your football career to say the least mm-hmm. you were from small and undersized, unrecruited in high school to walking on at Fresno State mm-hmm. to bouncing back to JUCO to going back to New Mexico, yeah. still underlooked to where you're at right now. We're going to get into all that. Yeah. But one thing that I love about it is you are like one of the most humble dudes that I know um, just for the fact that like you don't really gloat. You're not too active on social media. Like, if, if other people didn't mention you, like, where you're being, where you're at, you probably, nobody probably know. Uh, no, I probably <laughs> wouldn't. I don't think since January, I don't think I've actually posted anything. It's all been other people mentioning. Yeah. But that's just, like, because people always say, like, you're not great unless other people mention you. Like, if I'm just sitting here, like, putting stuff out there, like, like that's not the definition of great to me. No, That's I feel that. I look at it. Did you develop that when you were like a kid? Do you think is, is that like type of mentality you've had ever since you were a kid? I don't, it's it's just hard to say. Like, I just I had a I had examples in front of me for like my brothers, like because I feel like my brothers should have made it. So I kind of learned from them and seen what I needed to do and how I needed to act. And I know they helped me out with that too, just so they because they know I can do it. So yeah. that pushes me. So I think it's just since since like child like really really young so that's where i picked that up do you do you feel like part of it too is just that you feel like you haven't made it yet and that, you, you have a lot, lot more way to go like even if i do make a team this year like every year i know i'm gonna have to fight to make that team yeah just and then, because of my situation and then every year after that too that, it never yeah. stops right because somebody's always coming in and take take your spot yeah it's kind of like that uh interview you seen that interview with kobe and he was talking to that reporter and it was like after a finals game or something like that and they just won and the reporter's like like trying to make Kobe smile or laugh mm-hmm. and he's just like like what's wrong like you aren't you are you not happy and he's like oh, I want to be happy like job not done yeah. you seen that it's you know what I'm talking yet, about yeah. yeah yeah so that's I feel like that's kind of similar to your situation you know mm-hmm. did you kn- did you know that like when you were a little kid playing when did you start playing football by the way I think flag football I started when I was six La Puente Park La Puente Park yeah. who were you playing with back then we were the what were we, the Warriors. My dad was coaching me too. Your dad was coaching yeah. you. That's a cool dynamic, Dad. And then my first year tackles with Snoop with the Rolling Raiders. The Rolling Raiders. Yeah. And then that's that's kind of when he started the whole Snoop Youth League. Yeah, football, that was right? the first season. His first team. Talk about talk a little bit about that relationship that you guys had um, when you were a little kid and how it's developed. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, Try talking to Mike a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember how, like, I honestly don't know how he got in contact with my parents. But somehow they got in contact. He wanted me to come play for his team. And then, no, see, I, I misspoke. Rolling Raiders, that wasn't, that wasn't Snoop's team. I was playing with his son that year. 
Because, yeah, I think the Rolling was, Raiders, that was junior yeah, that All-American. Was, yeah, that's junior You're playing, like, West Covina Bruins and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was playing with his son, smallest guy on the team still. But, like, I was so good that the coach had to give me the ball. Like, do you know Darren Andrews? Yeah. Bishop Lamont. Yeah, uh-huh. his, his dad was a coach. Oh, he was? Yeah. Okay. So it was me and him at running back. And, you know, running back when you're little, that's the position. That's the shit. So we're just <laughs> – we're sharing the ball. I'm scoring. He's scoring. And then Snoop saw me. And then he started his league, asked me to – come play for his team and then I was his running back for two until junior high so high school so you just weren't sure how he how he heard of you he, j- he just like your name came about and he yeah I think just because I, well, I was playing with Cordell so he was going to a few games probably saw me so I okay. asked my parents how I'd go play with him with the with Pomona and then you started playing with him in junior junior high school yeah all junior the way high. up until high school all the way up until high school so I think I was like eight up until high school yeah, and you you were like super small even when you got to South Hills in high school. Mm-hmm. Like you were, how long do you think you were that small size? And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put a picture up there for mm-hmm. people to see like how yeah, small my you were. Freshman year in high school, I was a hundred pounds. I remember. It's crazy, but you were balling still. Yeah, it's the crazy part. We used to call you. I remember, um, because you were a few years younger than me. You were a freshman. I was a junior, and we were looking at this dude, and I'm, people were talking about you like, oh look at like the number eight on the freshman team. Like you guys had a pretty good squad too, yeah. and they're like. He's balling. I'm looking over there like, that guy? Like, he looks mm-hmm. small as shit. But I remember my first day <laughs> of summer camp when I walked on the field, everybody was looking at me like, like, who is this kid? Because I didn't know anybody. This is a new, this is a new school district. So I walk up, yeah. and they're just looking at me. I'm like. <laughs> they don't like, even know. Yeah, like <laughs> after a while, like, it just gets to a point where I, you have to play me because like I could do what anybody bigger than me could do yeah and better so that's the type of mentality you got to yeah. have too I had to have something similar like that because like you I was a lot undersized at my position mm-hmm. uh, playing safety and like you know the dynamics go like in football it's like a lot of people don't understand if you don't play this sport like basketball I mean it's a kind of a similar thing with size but like football you got to pass the eye test like yeah. eye test is super important for recruiting for people giving you respect like mm-hmm. if you're there, your opponent but when you come in with that chip on your shoulder, you know, you, you're the undersized. For me, it's like undersized, 5'10", white boy safety. Mm-hmm. Like, no, ain't nobody giving me respect, bro. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like having that mindset coming into it, it's like you already, you've already you been through it. Even even when you got into freshman year, right? Yeah. Like you've, had, you've already had to prove people wrong before that. Yeah, I'm, al- I'm always the smallest guy on the field. So, And then my dad, I think my dad... Just my dad didn't have, he didn't let me have any excuses growing up. My mom, she's my number one fan, so <laughs> I can't really put her in there because I can do no wrong to her. Yeah. But my dad, he's not going to let me be soft. Like, if I get knocked down, he's like, you better go get, like, hit him on the next play. Like, That's what's up. So, like, all growing up, like, he didn't let me be, be soft in it. It wasn't an excuse that I was smaller, so. That's important, too. That, that must have been really important for you to have that type of figure in your life. And I, I've talked about this in, like, previous podcasts, too where you got to be really careful who you take advice from, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say a lot of people aren't lucky enough to have their fathers in their life, right? So if you never had your father in your life to be that type of, um, have that type of presence in your life, you know, your mom is always going to tell you everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay that you mess up. It's okay that you lost. And those type of people, you know, sometimes don't end up having that, like, mentality growing up. But you having having your father to push you towards that probably helped out a lot, and it's obviously showing right yeah for sure i think that comes from his background just growing up in detroit he tells me stories where he oh he went from he's from detroit yeah he, he well he he was born in detroit grew up there a little bit and then he moved um born in hawaii moved to detroit Shit. grew up a little bit and then came to west covina but yeah he just told me stories about him having to fight every day so like looking at my life i'm like to him and my mom that was their goal so that we didn't have to go through we didn't have to move house to house. We didn't have to move city to city, state to state. So we were stable. We had everything we needed. But we still have that, that chip on his shoulder that, that he had and my mom had. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I can tell that you carried that through throughout your entire sports career too. But, yeah, going back to high school, undersized, you were still juking dudes out, like, left and right, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. giving them little shimmy shakes everywhere, left and right. Yeah, people yeah. yeah. And then – um probably towards like the probably towards like the later like s- sophomore junior senior year you started progressively getting better right yeah. like and started getting more looks would you say I think sophomore year playing JV I think that helped a lot I was able to and I played both yeah you floated because I, I, I practiced with you guys 
You still you, you had some good PT too. I, I remember I remember mm-hmm. towards the end of the year, your sophomore year, you progressively started playing more and more and more on yeah. varsity. Yeah, so playing both, I think getting those reps and just seeing the speed of everything helped me for my, my junior year. Yeah, so I was similar too. When I was a sophomore, I was floating too, and it helps a lot. You, you're playing like two games a year, especially if you're like actually actively on both teams. Yeah. It's like you're playing like 30 games a year. Yeah, I was playing on Thursday, and then I got to go back, get ready for Friday. Yeah, so. I loved it. I remember. Um, but did you, towards like the end of junior, senior year, were you getting many looks from Go. colleges? I, no, I was, you know, I get the regular, the letters from little small schools, but nothing, nothing serious. And throughout high school, I really didn't have anything serious. Yeah. I think people came in, you know, people come in and call you out of class to talk to you, different schools, but nobody was really that interested. And once you learn about how, how things work, like these schools are just going from school to school, seeing who's there but and then the the coach gives them the best players on the team so I just go in there but I walk in the room and it's like nah this kid's not him yeah it's the size thing you know Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter like it's really rare for you to have a small size and like still ball out and still get a scholar you know from your school like you have to have like just amazing numbers crazy numbers and I wasn't I wasn't that type of player like give me the ball every play so I could score like yeah whatever we had to do to win that's what I was going to do that's what's up. So, yeah, I mean, and so you you had no offers coming out of high school, right? I or did you have any? Western New Mexico. Western New Mexico. Okay, that's a D two, right? D two, yeah. D two. Okay, what what made you decide to pass that offer, and what made you walk on to Fresno State? I mean, I just I felt like I could play at that level, and looking back, it was pro- I probably should have went to JUCO because my body I just wasn't ready physically, but like mentally and. And just the way I work, I got out there and I, I competed, but I wasn't ready physically to play at that level to start. So I probably should have went to JUCO, but it was a it was a good experience overall. Yeah, when you walked on at Fresno State. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You were still making plays though, right? Like yeah, you dude, like practice. Fall time. camp, I was making some plays. Yeah. But it goes back to like being undersized, probably. Or I, yeah. the walk on lifestyle, bro, is like, <laughs> like, it's, and it's rough. Yeah. It's super rough, and you got to experience. That's really rare for you too, is to experience the walk-on life, the JUCO life, struggle, and the D1. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying from that. And I was similar when I was in uh when I went to uh, CSU, Colorado State, Mountain West boys. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I started off. I was um, I, w- I went straight to JUCO after high school, right? So I went to Mount Sac, mm-hmm. played two years there. I had some really small school offers from like small D2s, D3s, but. Like, in my head, I had a kind of similar mentality, I feel like, to you when you were in high school. You know, you're like, man, I could go to these, like, smaller schools. And usually when it's one of those smaller D2 schools and NAIA schools, like, you got to pay some money at the end of the day. Like, they don't oftentimes give you full scholarships. So they'll give you partials or half or whatever it may be. In my mind, I was like, honestly, if I'm going to pay for school, like, I might as well go to get the D1 experience and, like, actually do try to earn a scholarship so i mean i did that first year as a walk-on and then i ended up earning a scholarship after that one year um but yeah that first year it humbles you right Mm -hmm. it shows you that you really love football (laughs) like at the end of the day and there's a lot of people on scholarship that don't love football and you can you can see it too Mm -hmm. and the the other thing too is once you get to new mexico right once you get d1 once you get on that scholarship makes you appreciate it that much more Mm -hmm. than the other guy who just went there straight from high school exactly you know and there's it's just it's it's a problem all all around the country even at every level since i've seen it juco d1 any kind of d1 people think that they're better than they are and they they should be somewhere else so yeah and i know you've seen it at colorado state you guys have some good players that probably shouldn't have been there but yep but exactly. you see the ones that make it are the ones that take advantage of the opportunity yeah it's not good enough to just have talent anymore like yeah. there's a whole other dynamic from life that comes into play there's a lot of distractions and temptations and man I, like you said i've seen some good ass players fall off the map quick because mm-hmm. they think shit is sweet when they get up there and reality hits them like in the face yeah, it doesn't matter what level you came from you get bounced back it's like we got bounce back. I'm sure you've seen it too at Mount Sac. You get somebody coming in from a D1, and they don't they don't ever. Yeah, play. exactly. They think they're gonna come in and just be like mm-hmm. God's gift to Earth, and then oh. they get checked real quick. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I don't know. That kind of 
it hurts me to see people on the field who don't love football. Like, it really, like, it really gets to me. But There's a lot of them, too, yeah. you know? And, I mean, the good best players are going to play at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. But, like you said, that sometimes the best players that are playing don't love football. They're mm-hmm. just doing it for the check. They're doing it for the jersey. The, exactly, the jersey. And those are the type of players, too, man. Like, and, I, and the reason why I feel you on that is because – the ones that don't love football, you could tell that they're not going to, like, if the game's on the line or some type of shit, they're not going to be. Yeah, I, like, how can I trust you? Because mm-hmm. like, it doesn't really matter to you. So, exactly. What was I going to say? Um, yeah, and, like, I feel like in college you can fake it. You could fake not loving it until the end yeah. of your college career. But after that, like, only if you're not Deion Sanders, you're not going to be able to <laughs> yeah. just wake up and just be a star in the NFL. Or any kind of professional football. I see Canadian, these other leagues, like there's people that love this and work every day. And want your spot too. Yeah, yeah that's that's super important. And I mean, in a, in a way, I kind of understand it. Just some of the players that that are playing, but they realize that they don't love the sport, but they're still playing because a lot of it is like, you know, as an athlete, you get used a lot by the university sometimes. Like, they're going to, they're gonna, it's a business at the end of the day, yeah. right? You know what I mean? So sometimes these players, like, realize that, like, I'm going to, hey, I'm going to do what I have to do on the field. Like, I'm going to come mm-hmm. to practice. I'm going to come to the workouts, whatever it may be. But, like, some of them are just, like, my old co- my old coach used to call it stealing. <laughs> it's like, do <laughs> you have a coach? Like, yeah. They call it stealing where, like, they're just coming to practice, cl- coming in, clocking in, clocking out. Just so they could get their scholarship, get their stipend. Yeah, and I mean, I understand it too. Yeah, you know, like they, so a lot of people think they get used by the system, but that's all perspective to me. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna get in what you get. You're gonna get out of it what you put into it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Yeah, but yeah, the walk-on experience, crazy one, and that's awesome that you went through it. What made you decide to leave Fresno State um, and go back to a JUCO? I think I just I saw. I'm not going to say I saw the future, but I just didn't see it working out as fast as I wanted it to, Yeah, if you could say that. And then, you know, Fresno, they had, they had some good DBs. Some guys go to the NFL, and then they brought in some more JUCO DBs. So I was like, man, like, let me just go go back home, like, swallow my pride and yeah. Reassess. see what happens from there. Yeah, yeah. One, of my, one of my good friends, actually, my teammate at SAC, he went to, went to Fresno State, uh, Taekwondo Glass, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. He was a baller too, bro. He was overlooked like a crazy as fuck. And then yeah, he, he was long, had the size. Yeah, and then he barely got an offer last minute to Fresno State, like right before fall camp started. Like he got blessed real quick and just yeah. turned that opportunity into. I remember that. I just that's crazy. I was watching him on my way home. Um, they were playing. He's in because he's in Canada right yeah, now. Yeah, Eskimo. So they were playing. I was watching him play. Yeah, he's a good dude, bro. He mm-hmm. he deserves it. I, I hope he uh, ends up making it to the top too. Um. But, yeah, I mean, so that, that's a big turning point in your life, too. Like, when people usually leave, like, their D1 experience, their D1 experience as far as, like, being a walk-on, mm-hmm. like, usually that's it. Or, like, when you, that transition period from you leaving uh, Fresno State to going to JUCO, mm-hmm. that's, like, a, I feel like that's a big, like, turning point in your life, right? You, like, yeah. I mean, you had to have a lot of perseverance to think that, like, you could still make this work. Yeah, it was a, it was a big decision, and I had people, like, teammates telling me, like, man, you know, it's hard. You know how hard it is to get out of JUCO? And I was like, yeah, but should I got to try people do it. Like, why can't I do it? So yeah. I just had to go with the decision. I had Mount – it was either – I didn't really want to go to Mount Sac, so – Why I, was that? Why are you trying to go to Mount Sac, bro? Um, I should have recruited your ass, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had – I think it's because when I was – before I went to Fresno, I um, had some coaches hit me up from Fullerton. And I, to, I told them, nah, like, I'm walking on. So just when I decided to come home, that was just my first choice. Okay. And then I really didn't know anything about Fullerton, honestly. Yeah, you – honestly, like, where we're from, like, it's either Sac or Citrus. Yeah. <laughs> so I just – I'm always trying to be different. But Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I went to, went to Fullerton. And then I think that's where I – like took it up a notch, went to the next level. True. Like I never, if I would have stayed at Fresno, I wouldn't have been as good as I am. Yeah. Like technique wise and everything. Really, you had a good coach, position coach or something. Yeah. Like Phil Austin, my corner coach. He just, like I just listened to everything he said. He That's had all the techniques, all the different situations. I just did what he said and it showed on the field. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, especially too, like when you're at 
I had to go back to it again, but like when you're at like that walk on situation, it's like it's a process. Like if you're if you're let's say you're the shit and you're actually like a baller, it's gonna take them two years to put you on the field. Anyways, yeah. there's a lot of like football politics that come into play because they're investing money and, mm-hmm. and they're scholarship guys. So. Exactly, those scholarship guys come and they see you getting reps above them, then it's gonna be like it just looks bad on the coaches, you know? Yeah, recruiting wise. Exactly. And then now nowadays you could just leave whenever with the new. The new portal, portal in um, yep. college football, so you got to be careful yeah, how dude, you treat these players. Dudes is bouncing, like, left and right, three mm-hmm. different schools in their career and shit, like, in D1 levels. Yeah. That's wild. But, yeah, what, what, what advice would you uh, give JUCO players out there right now, like, if, you, if they had any? Um, I mean, just fine. It really – I feel like it doesn't matter what JUCO you go to. Like, just get there, you know, get in the system and just do what you love to do. Because um, at that point, you're not getting paid to do it. Yeah. So, I mean, you get your Pell Grant if, that, if you qualify for it. But you're not getting paid. You might as well have fun with it. Do what you love to do. You don't – it's nothing's promised. Yeah. Like, you don't – it's not guaranteed that you're going to get a scholarship. You might, but just have fun with it. Yeah, a lot of JUCOs are different, too. Like, you see the, like, Southern JUCOs, like, yeah, in Kansas, yeah. they get scholarships. Yeah, they get scholarships. <laughs> I was talking about Cali- California. We have – that's the Twitter debate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a real struggle. The Cali mm-hmm. JUCO, you don't get no uh, stipend. You don't get no scholarship. I mean, most dudes are going to qualify for, like – Yeah, for Pell Grant. For Pell Grant. And that's why I was – I'm just blessed with my situation with my mom and everything. I was able to live at home, got mm-hmm. my Pell Grant, and I didn't really – you know, I wasn't hungry. I know a lot of guys were hungry. So it's just, I know it's a lot for, for people to go through, but that yeah. just shows I saw some people come from across the country yeah, to same. struggle here mm-hmm. just to play a game they love. So Yeah, especially like in Florida, there's no JUCOs out there for mm-hmm. football to play football. And then uh, Hawaii too, there's mm-hmm. no football JUCOs out there. So a lot of those players end up coming to Cali to play JUCO. And yeah, I mean, it's sad to see, man. A lot of, my, a lot of the players uh living like eight seven eight nine people in one in a Mm two-bedroom apartment like sleeping on the floor struggling eating peanut butter jellies for dinner lunch and breakfast like you gotta go to the the little food pantries just to get food like yeah it's hard it is i try to i try my best to help a lot of the teammates like i gave them rides where and whenever wherever to different places try to get better but yeah it's a different dynamic like at sack bro it was like ruthless like we used to (laughs) I'm not gonna name like certain coaches, but like we used to have, like have to get in like fights, bro. To like for one on ones, and that was a big difference from like JUCO to D1. Like in JUCO, dudes were like literally throwing blows on the sidelines for reps. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? To like get those one on one reps or whatever, and it'd be like coach would pick the ones, and then two and three coach would be like, y'all figure out who's going two or three. <laughs> <laughs> wow, That's and dude, crazy. yeah, and dudes would be like, the shit would get heated. But then. That's the thing. You go to. I wanted to start going to D one, and it's like dudes were like shying away from yeah, the reps. Like, yeah. yeah, and I'm like, okay, like <laughs> I might get burned by some of these D one dudes. I got burned a few times, but I'm like, yo, like yeah. it's gonna get you better, right? That's the only way to get better. Mm-hmm. You get beat. So exactly. But you won. You ended up winning a national championship, right? Yeah, my second year there. I had after my first season, I had a scholarship to offer to Arkansas State and Murray State. But what, I, what made you? Pass out but Arkansas it. State, they came late before. Like, I was getting re- – we were getting ready for the season. It was during the summer. And I was like, I just wasn't feeling it. They weren't going to let me come on a visit. Oh. And then when I told him no, he was like, okay, well, well, we'll let you come on a visit. And I was like, no, something just – it just didn't feel right. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to stay here another season. And then I ended up having a, a better season than I can imagine. For real? Yeah. Yeah, and then you got that experience to be on that championship. Yeah, winning that. I've never really – other than when I was little, I never really run, won anything. So <laughs> that was big, too. Yeah. And that was a good season. That was a fun season. Yeah. So I had, what I have, six interceptions. And that's Damn, what, that's it's crazy. Up. My corner coach told me, he's like, if you want to get a scholarship, you have to have at least six interceptions. Yep, those those offers are like are stages two picks versus four picks versus yeah. six picks. Those offers are going to be different. And he, he told me, he, and he said, what your height is going to be hard for you. With six picks, it's going to be hard for you to get a scholarship. And I think I put all my trust in him, and he – all throughout the season, I didn't really have anything. I had Stephen F. Austin as well. And I was just like, man, I'm just going to stick it out. Like, I was focused on winning the championship at that yeah. point. And then a day before – two days before signing day, 
in December, New Mexico called me, and, and that was it. For real? Yeah. Yeah, so then after New Mexico, you just like a rap, like you're like, I'll take it. Yeah, I didn't even go on a visit. You didn't even go on a visit? No, nope. I said I wanted to play in the Mountain West. So. You did? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what's up. Yeah, I mean, taking that offer, still being a little, because I mean, six picks and like, I'm, you said you had a great season on a national championship t- yeah. team too, you know. I mean, playing the Mountain West is cool, but you would, I mean, I feel like you would expect some like power five offers, you know what I mean, for that yeah. type of season. I'm not going to lie and say I didn't. But, you know, I understood. Yeah. Like, we had guys from UCLA because my, my DB coach had ties to UCLA. And he was like, coaches would be like, we like him, but, like, I wish he was two inches taller. Like, that's, what I, that's, that's what I heard, two inches. The difference from me being in the Mountain West and Pac-12. That's crazy. Power Five conferences. Yeah. And that's it's sad, bro, because, like, ballers ball. Like, you can – be mm-hmm. the shortest corner you make plays bro like yeah it's sad to see that's how that's how it is you know and that's what i at the next level in the nfl that's what i see there's people all sizes all different body types it, it doesn't matter if you could play you could play yeah yeah yeah. that's what's up and the the i had a similar experience too when i was at sac we won the uh, state championship like a share of the national championship too that's the only championship i ever won but like I mean, do you see a difference from being on a championship team versus, like, any of the other teams you've ever been on? Like, is there, like, an it factor, you know what I'm saying, to, like, having a championship team, do you think? Yeah, it's definitely the, the camaraderie between the players, like, really trusting each other and buying into the coaches. Like, buying into each other and buying into the coaches. The coaches is a different story sometimes because, you know, some people might not like their coaches, but yeah. I think it's just us as a group. We didn't. We knew when we walked on the field, we tried to intimidate you before we walked on the field. Yeah. And then when we got on the field, we just didn't stop. So that's just the mentality we had. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I experienced like something similar too. There's a lot of leadership that has to go on too, and it has to be from like the jump, like from off season workouts. Like you got to like set a standard. And you got to – and it's a lot of it's too – I want to talk about this because you're on the Patriots now, right? Mm-hmm. They have that type of culture where it's like a winner's championship team mentality. My, my, one of my coaches from, uh, from CSU actually mentioned something like this. He's just like the reason why they're so successful is because they have that culture already implemented into um, their organization. So you see – sometimes you see a lot of uh, beha- uh, players that have had like issues in the past with off-the-field issues, right? And then they come in to that system and they ended up work, they end up working out with them and like they don't have any any off the field issues after that you know what i'm saying and the reason is because when you come from the outside to the inside you there's that culture that's already set there so it's like you have two options when that when that player gets there either you conform and you get with the program exactly. or you get outcasted exactly. and most times it's by human nature people want to be part of something so when you get to that team that's really what molds them and yeah, it's just, championship I think team. winning. When you win, there's no excuse not to. Like you, why wouldn't you not want to be, like fit into that mold? Like it's just, it's just simple. And then that's what with my JUCO team. That's we were winning, and everybody got with the program. And if you didn't want to win, like there was plenty of people who just left. And it was like that's fine. Like yeah, but we're gonna keep winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of people are coming, and leaving, like left and right. Mm-hmm. But you feel, do you feel that culture? Like, I know you haven't been with Patriots that long, but do you feel mm-hmm. that culture with them? Like, Yeah, just as a rookie, we come in and it's thrown at you and you have to get with it. You, you definitely feel it when you walk in the building. Yeah, bro, you, why, you, why you got number 70 on this shit? That's I just, see all the yeah. rookies, they have, like, uh, different, no, mm-hmm. different numbers, right? I think that's just to have us, you know, not focus on all the, the bling and all the, yeah. the rah-rah. Like, we just focus on playing football. Yeah, I saw, like, quarterbacks on, like, number 50-something, mm-hmm. and, like, that's crazy. But that's cool. They're, like, one of the only – I haven't seen another NFL team do no, really I, do that, I don't you know? know another team that does it either. Yeah, that's dope. Um, but, yeah, let's go back to – you're done, done with JUCO. You had a great last season. You go to New Mexico. Um, talk about your experience at New Mexico. So, when I, I – I was excited to go there just because of the defense they ran. I was so used to being up, playing press, man. And that's what they said. They're, like, you're going to come in. That's what you're going to do. So, I get there. And, um, like, that's what I did all season. Did you get to come in mid-year, like spring? Yeah, I, you... I got there in January. Oh, so you get to play spring ball. That's so important. I did spring ball, went through all that. You know, and I felt like we had a, you know, a good, good chance to compete in the Mountain West. It didn't go as we planned, but 
I think I had a, I feel like my junior season was better than my senior season. For real? Yeah. Yeah. And then you get there, talk about the uh, differences from, some of the differences from D1 to JUCO. I didn't, like? Yeah, I mean, on the defense, it really wasn't too much. You know, obviously there's, these receivers can make any kind of catch, like, and on any given day, like. Yeah. So you just have to be on top of your game. And then I feel like, I don't know, I think it's minor, but just conditioning-wise, like, I was way more gassed in, in college than yeah. I was in JUCO. The altitude kind of hits different, yeah, too. Yeah, the altitude, too. <laughs> and that cold. Yeah, the cold. <laughs> the, di- the different environments, too. You're put in a lot of different environments. like. And then when we went to Texas A&M, couldn't even hear Oh, you played too. Texas A&M yeah. at College Station? Mm-hmm. That must have been a cool experience. That was a cool experience, so. I mean, but after a while, you just get used to it. You zone in, and you're just playing this you against the man in front of you. Yeah. We played Bama. I'm here wearing a Bama hat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. We watched that game on film a lot. For real? Yeah. yeah. It's for swag purposes only. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm wearing these yeah, matches. But, uh, yeah, I mean, biggest thing that I noticed is a lot of, especially, like, I don't know I don't know how your coaches were in JUCO, but, like, when you get to D1, like, your are the D1 coaches, like, critique every little thing you do, like, as far as, like, the big yeah. jump from one another. It's, like, every step you take. They, like, they literally grade every play you do. Mm-hmm. Like, you're getting watched like a hawk versus, like, D1 or, like, JUCO. Like, at least our coaches, like, it was just, like, you made the play, you made the play. Like, yeah. and I think that's why I can't really see too many differences because my, my JUCO coach was, like, I feel like he should be at the next level. Yeah. So he was like, like that? Yeah, so he was he was like that with everything. He told me what I should expect. So I really – there was nothing that surprised me when I got there. So it was a smoother transition yeah. because you were already going through that process mm-hmm. before. Yeah, okay. That makes sense, man. For me, yeah, it was – I'm sure a lot of the Juco that aren't like – Yeah, it's different for everybody. Yeah, sure. that lucky because it was like night and day for me. And then, too, you're getting fed. Yeah, you're getting fed. Now you're getting a little paycheck. Yeah, that stipend. Everything set up for you, your schedule. Because JUCO, what I had class at 8 and then practice until 6. So you're there all day. Like, it wasn't like that for me at, in New Mexico. Yeah, so you made your own schedule, load. right? Yeah. What did you get your, what did you study? In business. You studied I business? Got my degree, yeah. Okay. Do you got any, like, interests outside of ball? Like, is there anything that, like. I'm kind of, like, weird. I have, like, I watch weird stuff on Netflix, but I mean. Like, what? Like about space. And the space? You seen that new? Uh, I was watching it last night. That Area Fifty One um, documentary. I haven't seen it. You gotta watch it. You'd I'm like have it. To go back and watch it. Yeah. yeah, I watch. I watch a lot of weird stuff. But I'm I'm into real estate. That's something I think I really want to get into. Not just like buying houses, but like real estate development, building apartment complexes, high sky rock, Um, what is it? Like in downtown areas, like skyscrapers, all that. Yeah. Like I know it's a big, but you gotta you gotta dream big if you want to get there. So what what interests you about that industry? I, don't, I think you just see it every day, just driving down the street. Like it's all around you, and it's like just seeing something be built from nothing into something, and then you use it. You could use it forever. It'll last forever. Like I don't. That just interests me. Yeah, that's dope. And then obviously too, the money aspect. You yeah, you're like you're making money while you're asleep. Yep, Basically. you're investing your money and doubling it up, tripling it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy that, like, now even, like, if you get really technical into it, like, you get charged for how high your building is. Like, mm-hmm. you paying rent for spate, like, <laughs> for mm-hmm. for air. That's crazy. You got to pay rent for that. That's dope, though. Um, Yeah, going back to, so you finished at New Mexico. You had a good two seasons. Um, How was the scouting process after New Mexico? So that was, that was the thing that really hit me hard because I was like because I didn't really know much about agents and then the scouting process I didn't know that I should have already been talking to agents during my senior season really yeah like they recruit they're not supposed to technically but they recruit before your season senior season and throughout your senior season I haven't heard anything and then the season was over still didn't hear anything it's December I'm like did you even have an agent at that point mm -mm. there's bowl games coming up I, I still haven't heard anything. Yeah, when we – do you guys didn't have it um, – for us, it was, like, before senior year, all the seniors and, like, draft prospects, we all had a meeting, um, like, before season starts to, like, go over all this shit. So, like, you were prepared for, like, when the season went on, how the process is supposed to go. You didn't have that? I think we had, like, 
it was called Junior Day or something. Junior Day? When the, some two NFL reps come in. I think we had the same thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. But but um, going into December, you didn't have any? No agents, no looks. I probably wasn't. I wasn't considered a prospect. So you were late on the process whole. Mm-hmm. So I, I had, um, I have a family, family friend that's in the scouting business. His name's Perry. So I called him up and I was like, like basically what should I do? And he called some of his buddies in scouting. And he was like, well, they don't, they don't have you as a prospect. Like, so I think. You're not even on any of the boards or anything? No, no one's bored. Nobody's looking at you. Damn. So the, the senior bowl, all that, all those bowl games, I wasn't going to get invited to. So he was like, you just got to, you got to show up for your pro day. Like, that's the only way. So, and that's how I, I called up SIP. My uncle called SIP. And Cause you, we, you've been training for SIP for a while. I mean, we, we worked out together. Yeah, SIP we worked before. out there. Yeah. I, that was the only time I've been there. Oh, really? That, that went, one off season, right? Yeah. Before I went to New Mexico. So, but my uncle's always, my uncle coached his son. So they had a, they always keep in contact. And when I needed a trainer, my uncle called him and he was like, yeah, come on. Like. He doesn't even do. He didn't do pro day combine training anymore. But he he was doing me a favor. Yeah. So we we started on that. I think it was a good ten weeks before my my pro day. That's awesome. Yeah. So I was really like I don't show my emotions. I try not to. But I was I was down before that. I was like, man, like I'm about to have. I'm gonna get a job. Like the reality is yeah. setting in. Like, right. Let me get my resume together. Like. <laughs> I'm not about to be sitting at my mom's house. That's crazy. Because yeah. when you think about it, it's like, it's hard, bro. Like, people don't like to show it to you, especially, like, athletes after their career ends. But it's like, look, you're playing this sport since you're, like, four or five. This is your passion. You've been doing this. Your dream has been to make it ever since you are a little kid. And then it just ends. Mm-hmm. And nobody's feeling sorry for you. Oh. Nope. No, nobody's, like, expects you to do anything. It's, like, a weird dynamic, you know? Yeah. It's so just, It's just over one day. Yeah, it is. But that's why it's awesome to see that you're still, like, in the fight, bro. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And I think it's just good to have people around you that value the same things as you. Because I, like, I've always said I don't want to be looked at as just a football player. And I know it's hard for people to, for me to tell that to people now because I've made it to that next step. But yeah. I really want to do more than football. Like, and these NFL players, they're doing more. We don't see it, but they're doing more than football on a daily basis. Like in the community? Or? It's in the community, businesses. They own car lots. Like They own a lot of this stuff we see, but they're just doing it behind the scenes. Yeah. We only see them on the field. So I just, my boys at New Mexico, Luan, you remember Luan? Yeah. And then Carlos. And then my boy from New Mexico, my roommate, his name's Anu. I talk to him every day, and we, we both value the same things. We talk about what we want to do in life other than football. So That's it's kind of preparing us for when it – because it's going to be over one day. So mm-hmm. we just try to prepare ourselves for that. Yeah. And we don't we – don't, I don't want to get stuck in the one-track mind of football. Yeah. You know, I love it so much, but I know it's going to be over one day. Yeah. No, it's super important. It's, an, it's smart that you're taking those steps right now and thinking about that and mm-hmm. putting yourself around people that have conversations like that. You know what I'm saying? When you start to put yourself around those people and have these type of conversations rather than um, – some other friends you might have where you're talking about the par- money, money, party. partying, yeah. girls, you know what I'm saying? When your conversations and your talks start to elevate, like your whole life changes, like yeah. your values start to be put in different places too. For sure. You know, so yeah, you having those talks are really important. And the fact that you, like I said, you put yourself around those type of people, it's going to, it's a good recipe for success. What are, what are the, some of the other things that you said you wanted to do is like real estate, like you want to be more active in the community or yeah i want to i that's the that's the thing i need to figure out just being up there in new england like everyone has the little thing that they do in the community so i like i need to find what i'm passionate about and something that i want to give back to so that's something you know i went to the children's hospital up there and that was a cool experience seeing yeah. those guys how happy they are just to see us yeah they like look we, at you guys like superheroes yeah so i just i that's something i need to figure out you know, something I'm passionate about in the community. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I know coming from La Puente, they, they, they support me a lot. And just because it's a, it's a small town, working people, working hard. Mm-hmm. Not many people make it to a, People make it professionally, but I don't think on a stage like, like the NFL. Yeah. Like having a brand like that. So Exactly. You got to use it. I mean, you, you, you're, like you said, it doesn't last a long time. Mm-hmm. 
while you have it you got to make the most out of it and yeah like you said it's important to prepare for after because once you get to that level you have the capital to put yourself in opportunities that others don't mm -hmm. that's one of the things that is a difference between like people not making out of places a lot like la puente or other places is because it's really comes down to socioeconomics like it's not fair because they're put in situations where they don't have an option to make it a lot of these opportunities that you need like you need capital to double up you need capital to invest in different opportunities that interest you you know what i'm saying if you don't have that initial capital it makes it that much harder to yeah, make it it's difficult that starts with educating yourself getting that piece of paper yep. even though sometimes it might not mean much because college is the system's a little messed up but <laughs> Yeah, just getting that knowledge and then growing your wealth so you can have some type of power. Like, if we're all sitting here and we can't, we're, we're uh, you know, living check, paycheck to paycheck, then we have no power and we can't really change much. Can't get out of our situation. And that's yeah. what, just trying to get out of the cycle of your family is hard. Yeah. If you come from a rough background. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just trying to, my dad, he wants me to get out, see the world, be on my own, be successful. So that's. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's crazy where football could take you. Like, and you've started experiencing it in D1, like all the places you get to travel to. And it just gives a lot of security too, just for your future. We mm -hmm. learned about all the benefits when you become a vested player after three seasons. Like, if you play your cards right, you could be taken care of for the rest of your life. Yeah. And then you could really just do focus on something else. Yeah, that's awesome. I th I feel like I seen that a lot around the league too. Now it's like players are wising up and they're putting their money in the right places versus. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like 20 years ago, more than that, it wasn't the case. People were blowing it. Yeah, and they're um, not playing as long because mm -hmm. they're able to save their money. They don't want to put their body through that. Yeah. Well, talk about, um, so you had, uh, you had that whole process going prior to Pro Day, and you started working with SIP, and you realized you had, you had to ball out for Pro Day. Mm -hmm. And shit, you fucking showed out yeah. <laughs> Pro Day, right? I, I surprised myself. <laughs> I was running a fourth. I was just trying to run a 4-4. So, but Sip, he told me, um, he was like, you're going to run a 4-3. Was it electric time too? No, it was hand, hand time. Hand time? Okay. So, yeah, working with him, when I got to him, I was hurt just from the season. Like, my, my lingering, back was tight. Lingering injuries. Yeah, core was weak. So, it was affecting the way I run. I couldn't really run. I ran 140, and I was, like, limping. Damn. So, like, he, he took, like, a month just to get me right. I went and saw a doctor. And then we just started getting stronger from there. Yeah. And then got to my pro day. It started off with a vertical. I jumped to 39, and I was like, it's crazy. It's about to be a good day. So, <laughs> and I had my boys with me. I knew I got to shout them out. Yeah. I knew Q, Blair. They were just sitting there cheering me on. They were, they were more proud than me. They were about to cry. But so well, yeah. that showed the support I had. Like, yeah. really. My dad was there. My uncle was there. So I jumped at 39, ran the 4 3. And then agents started calling, like, before I even got home. For real? Mm -hmm. So those, those numbers really put you on notice, yeah, right? immediately. So the agents started. I think I had a list of, like, 20 agents. So then I had to hurry up and pick one. Damn. That's crazy. You went from uh, not, on, not on anybody's board, not any agents, to nothing. one day like that. Mm -hmm. And then, so my agent, Joe Lenta, he represents um, Joe Flacco. So he flew me out to New Jersey, and I met with him, did a little workout, and then I felt like he was the right guy. So I went with him, got a private workout with the Chargers. That was cool, and then, and it was just a waiting game from there, really. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, good things happen to good people, right? That's if, you, yep. if you keep your head down and keep working and do what you're supposed to do, it's just gonna work out the right way it's supposed to. And yeah. like, yeah. I'm not sure how, like, if, how strong you are with faith or whatever, you know what I'm saying, but like, God's going to take care of you. If God didn't want you to be in this situation, he wanted to put you in it, right? Yep. That's, I was just at church this morning. The pastor had me come up. He did a prayer for me. And I said a few things. I was just like, I know the way everything went, the way everything's worked out for me in my football career, it has to be something above me, you yeah. know, helping me through this process. Like, And I'm not the most religious person, but I am spiritual. Yeah. And I believe in karma. Like, if you do bad your whole life, you know, more times than not. It's going to come back to yeah, get you at some point. it's going to come back around. So, yeah, it's definitely the way it's worked out. It's crazy. I've yeah. always, through every step of my career, it's been the same thing, just sitting there waiting. 
wondering what the next step's going to be, but it always comes. It always comes, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's just you, like I said, putting your head down and working and trusting God that it's going to, the process mm-hmm. is going to work out the way it's supposed to, that's right? My, that's my mom's work, too. True. Yeah, she, I know she prays for me every day. A new praise for me every day. Hell yeah. Like so I got I have people in my corner. When you do right by people, it it really helps you. Yeah, shout out to mom, man. Mm-hmm. That's a that's awesome. Like you're an easy person to root for, bro. Like you're humble, you do what you're supposed to. And I know you being humble right now is <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, and I had to learn to give myself some credit sometime. Like making it to this step, I was still as you know how I am, I was just like, Yeah, but it's 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 the next step. My mom's like, Come on, like you a lot of people don't even get this opportunity. I was like, you know, you're right. Like, That's crazy. I can enjoy it a little bit. Because making it to D1, you're in the 1% already. Mm-hmm. Now you're making it to NFL, is then you're in the 0.001%. Mm-hmm. Do, you ever take, do you ever take time to, like, step back? And I, yeah, I had to learn to, to just step back and appreciate it a little bit more. Just realize where I'm at, how many people are trying to get here, just to get the opportunity. Because I haven't made a team yet, mm-hmm. and I don't know what team I may be on, so... It's a long but, journey. Yeah, but just the opportunity, it's, it's crazy. It's beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so talk about when you got that call with the, with the Patriots. What what type of emotions were you feeling? My, I see my, my dad was in the room with me. My uncle was in the room with me. They were more excited than me. <laughs> but I had, because I had my head stuck on the Chargers because I thought they were really interested. Because of that workout. Mm-hmm. And then my agent was telling me, yeah, I think the Chargers really like you. And then towards the end of the draft he was like I think it's gonna be the Patriots and I was looking at their roster and I was like man like they got a lot of good guys like I don't know if I want to go there but then he's like man like it's it's the Patriots like they keep calling and then he told me like you'll be stupid if you don't take this <laughs> yeah and I was like you know what like let's go there's some fear in there yeah like, I'm not gonna lie just going that far that level of competition and, and then like how storied of a program they have mm-hmm. so there was that fear but it took me a couple of days to really get excited about it and be ready to go. Yeah. I mean, all high hopes that you make it with them. But even if you don't, bro, like mm-hmm. one of the dudes I'm going to have on next week on the podcast, Zach, my good, my good friend Zach, he was on six teams last year. He mm-hmm. was on the Chargers. He was on uh, the 49ers. He was on the Cardinals. He was on the Colts. And now he's on the Chiefs. And that was all his rookie year last year. So, like, I talked about him a lot with that. And if you, like, yeah, if you ball out and, like, you don't make the team, bro, there's, there's a, others. hella other teams. There's that 31 other teams. And yeah. then it's going to go back to that same process that you had in the, like, that's been working out for you the past. You just do you, and God, God wants you to have it. He's going to give it to you. Yeah, I'm definitely confident in that. And just being with, being with New England, they, they only pick the best of the best. So, I'm already yeah. a step ahead of some people. Exactly. So, you just getting that competition in that type of program is going to be good for you, right? Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. So I'm excited. August 8th, Detroit, in my first preseason game. So. August 8th? Mm-hmm. We'll be watching, man. We're yeah. excited for that. But so, yeah, that was definitely a big moment for you getting that call. What is, are there any, is there any, like, what's the most emotional moment you ever had playing football in your entire career, would you say? The only, that's, it just popped right in my head. <laughs> I, last season, my senior season, I cried on the field. Cause That's we, how it was? we lost. No, no. I, oh. At New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Yeah, I literally cried because I was so mad we went, we weren't gonna make it to a bowl game. Oh, was the last game uh, gonna decide if you're bowl eligible yeah, or not? Yeah, yeah. We were playing Air Force up at Air Force, and I just saw the game slipping away, and I just I couldn't even hold it back. I was so mad, and that yeah. like that's that's the first time I like let it go like, and that's when it, it showed me like I really do love playing this game. Like, I could sit here and cry in front of my teammates. Yeah. And it's like whatever, but you got it's that competitor and you're coming out too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really I felt it. That was a hard flight flight home. I already know. One of the toughest games I had was against Boise State in 2017. They were like ranked whatever. Obviously, they're always like ranked every year in our in our division, Mount West, and we were beating them like 42 to 14 or something, bro. In like the second or third quarter, they came back. Went to overtime, mm. beat us. Mm-hmm. We thought, like, we had it on lock. Oh, my God. Like, we were so sick. I've never been so sick in my life, like, about a loss. Yeah. And something like that, man. It's hard. But, yeah, you keep on you keep on pushing on. And, I mean, 
I'm sure there's going to be a lot more moments like that for you just being a competitor, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. It's going to happen. There's plays where it, it just wants to come out. You get so mad, but you got to – at corner, you can't, you can't dwell on I was on about to say that, like that too. Yeah. It's, you got to have a different type of uh, yeah, cause, dog in you. Because everybody loves you when you're making the plays, but then I want to play. And everybody's they're not on your side anymore. So. Yeah, and it's gonna happen. Nobody, every the best corner in the league is gonna get no. burnt sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You just gotta have a thick skin. And no, you can't let people who have never played judge you either. Yeah, I think that's another big thing. Like, just don't even like block out all the noise because these people don't they don't play the position. They don't understand. And sometimes it's not even your fault when you get beat or something yeah. but it looks like it's it your fault like, yeah, yeah. it could be a wrong coverage if safety so, didn't help you over the top yeah um, a lot of people just don't understand <laughs> yeah and then uh two it's like your like linebackers mistakes d linemen's mistakes mm -hmm. mis are missed tackles your mistakes are touchdowns yep you can't make a mistake in the secondary like last line of defense yeah definitely no i feel you man db is a dirty boy life is something crazy mm -hmm. something crazy well, it should be the most confident people that's why like, you have to be confident to play the position. Yeah, yeah. Against your opposition, just think you could lock up anybody at mm -hmm. any time, right? Yeah. And that's definitely my mindset. People look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, hey, you going to lead? You think you could lock up Julio? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to be not? scared. Yeah. yeah. You can't say you're not going to. No, I'm going to go Julio. out there and I'm going to. You have to make an amazing play to beat me. That's how I look at every play. Yeah. That's what's up. <coughs> what, are, uh, what were some of your inspirations growing up? Uh like football player wise, football player wise, or just life wise. Um, well, football. I was. I thought I was gonna play running back, so I was a big Reggie Bush fan. Yeah. Watching him at at the Coliseum, and then, um, Ladamian Thomason was a big inspiration to me. I didn't really start playing corner till till high school, and then, I don't know. Just, I had. I can't say I don't have a story like a lot of these people. I didn't have a rough, you know, upbringing. My my parents. They divorced, but still have a relationship with both of them. Great relationship. Yeah. They gave us everything we needed, but I don't know. There's just, I strive to just, I just want to see more. I want to do more. I want to accomplish more right. than anybody. So that's, that's kind of what drives me. I don't know where it's from. I know my, my parents work hard. They don't have degrees, but they always start a job and, and then they end up being a supervisor. So okay. they're always working their way up. So it's like, I have no reason. There's no reason why I can't work my way up okay. in life and just do something that no one's ever done before. And I'm still trying to figure that out. I think that's what I've figured out about life. Like, you don't, you don't leave anything when you, when you pass away. You don't leave, like, the money. Like, that's fine. But you leave, what you leave people with is, like, your, the knowledge that you give people. So I think just... You know, just helping people, like, with this process. I have knowledge that, that people can, you know, they can benefit from this. So I think that's yeah. the, the biggest thing I've learned about life, just trying to help people. And that's hard for me because I like to be by myself. But, yeah. like, just starting with this, this is a big step for me, just getting my, my words out there and getting my knowledge out there for people. It's going to help a lot, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a lot to offer, bro. Like, I know you're pretty, like you said, you're, like, more quiet. Mm -hmm. You you're probably not to certain people like your your boy yeah. I knew and different people like that right but mm -hmm. I mean I feel like you do have a lot to offer people like a lot of people sharing your story and just people like not even you having to say anything but people knowing about your story mm -hmm. just walk on undersized juco d1 man if you could do it like it's gonna give faith to some kid out there who doesn't doesn't think yeah. there's a way out like I've that. seen a lot there's kids messaging me and they're like thank you for replying and I'm like like, what do you <laughs> it's mean? crazy like, yeah i'm why wouldn't i reply like but you don't realize it until someone shows you that you're on that that level so you have to use it in a positive way yeah i mean when i was a kid and i used to look at like people like in your position or when i was a little kid i was just like i, I can see why because i was a little kid i used to think like nfl players were like god you know like they were just the highest thing and like i would re want to respect them so bad and so you start growing up and it was these people will start becoming like your friends and these people are like your peers. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a lot different. Cause like you see them as people or they're not some like figure that's unobtainable, unobtainable. Yeah. You like know? you, we really don't, we look at celebrities like they're not real people yeah. most of the time, but there's a lot of good in, in these people and they want to help you as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome that you want to do that. And I think you should continue to keep on 
speaking your words and let people know that there is a way out through just telling your story honestly because you have an amazing story man appreciate it yeah yeah, yeah. is there any uh where can people find you like as far as uh, like social media and everything and if people want to dang i should know this by heart <laughs> but yeah i got i'm on all yeah, i got instagram what is it d ross underscore this is how much I'm not on here. D Ross <laughs> underscore O three. That's Instagram and then Twitter. Um it's always D Ross. D Ross underscore eight on Twitter. Okay. And one more thing. What would you tell a young kid who has aspirations to make it to the NFL? Man, you gotta you really have to dig deep and figure out if you if you if this is something you wanna do because it's not easy. I thought it was gonna be like I'm you have the talent. You get up there. You just play football. But there's a lot more that goes into it. Conditioning on a different level. Nutrition on a different level. I didn't ever think about what I was eating. But now I have to think about what I'm putting in my body. It matters. Um, you know, pay attention to these skills that you learn in college, like time management skills. Waking up early in the morning. Because football, it's all, it looks pretty on TV on Sundays, but it's, it's a job all week. Yeah. So just be prepared to go at it like you would go at it a regular job, like how your parents approach the day. And then make sure you love the game, but also have a few other things that you're interested in as well. It'll just help you. You have to have something to fall back on. You have to have something else to think about sometimes. You don't want to think about football 24-7. Yeah. So just to have those different interests. Just have knowledge about stuff. Knowledge is power. Like, it's cliche, but. No, no, definitely. It's the truth. Yeah. I'm, one thing I was glad of that I did towards, like, the end of senior year is, I started like acting on different interests that I had. When I was at CSU, I started doing a radio show. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Yeah, it led me to this. You know what I'm saying? And I started. I got into music. I got into photography, and I felt like so free. Like not like this is what I like too. Like a lot of like players complain about they don't have time. They don't have time for this. They don't have time to do that. They don't have time for all these other opportunities. But it's the life you chose. Like it's part of the life you chose. You know what I'm saying? You can't complain about something that you signed up for. You know and so once I got done with it, just exploring all these different avenues, like it's crazy, like out there, if you, like you said, even if you're a ball player, like take the time to find other interests in your life. Because if you do that while you're playing, the transition isn't going to be as hard. I've seen some dudes like where like football was everything and football's over and they're like devastated. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So finding that extra interest and acting on it is going to be super important. Yeah. And then use your. You got to use your resources in college, too, if you're – It's I think they have resources at every level, really, just people to find, helping you find internships and just different employers. Like, people have relationships with colleges. You can always go back to and get a – they love to hire football players. So, yep. like, you can shadow people, job shadow, internships, all that. So just use your resources and all that and figure out what you really love in life, figure out what your purpose is, and you're, all, you're never going to figure out – you're always going to keep – growing i know that's something like the podcast is about yeah. growth, positivity like you're always mm -hmm. going to keep growing figuring out new things that you're interested in so that's just something yeah that's the recipe i love it i love it uh but yeah man we we're, we're all going to be rooting for you i'm rooting for you you know that you're gonna have a lot of people in your corner and august 8th, august 8th yeah. best of luck man august 8th we appreciate you doing it yeah, no problem. d ross